Well, we're back with our guest, Rebecca Telcher. She's with New Haven Asset Management. Let's begin uh, with some thoughts on our top story, the two big retailers, and we'll move on uh, after that to your thoughts on uh, economic risks around the world. What do you think about the big retailers? Yeah, so, you know, I think Walmart's um, earnings was very interesting. I think my key takeaways on that is you're seeing customers showing discretion. So they're putting fewer items in their cart than the, what they have done historically, but they are shopping more frequently. So that's, you know, to me, that tells me that they're probably looking at the weekly flyer. They're maybe stocking up on items that are on sale. Um, you could see that there was, you know, the electronics have been a tougher sell for them. So in general, I think customers are seeking value. And to me, you know, Walmart is also a sign of that trade down of, you know, consumers that are usually like shopping, doing their groceries at regular grocery stores that are maybe seeking more value. And now they want to shop at Walmart for better deals. So to me, this is an overall sign of a weaker economy and a mm -hmm. more cautious consumer. The CEO of Walmart, in fact, uh, echoing your thoughts, he says they are being choiceful. Choiceful is the word he used uh, to, to describe uh, consumers. They spend less per trip, but have been shopping frequently, according to the CEO, uh, the chief financial officer, I should, should say, of Walmart, uh, John David uh, Rainey. What about uh, Home Depot? D do you agree uh, with our guest, uh, John Edwards, uh, and seemingly investors that the worst of the home renovation slump may be uh, on the horizon? You know, it's interesting. Home Depot, I've always said this, that you know, we are never going to see interest rates rise as fast as they have and for it to have no impact on the general economy. And I think we're seeing that with a stock like Home Depot. So you're seeing that pullback in home improvement because interest rates are so high. So there's, you know, less activity going on in the real estate market. And Home Depot was also one of the names that you had a lot of pulled forward demand from the pandemic that's now tapering off. So I think in the long, long term, Home Depot is OK. But I think in the short term, you know, it, there, there could be some further weakness. Okay, uh, let's pivot to uh, economies around the world and uh, what you see is the risk uh, per perhaps of uh, economic contagion. We've told our viewers that the Chinese government is clearly trying now to stimulate the economy. It's cut rates for the first time in a while. It's, so it's interesting. Um, you know, I feel like when I look at the U.S. market, there's a bit of a tunnel vision going on. And so everyone is looking at, you know, stronger economic data and everyone, you know, has basically said that there's not going to be a recession happening. But then I look at what's going on around the world and I think to myself with the you know, the global market is integrated as it is today, it's impossible that there's not going to be any kind of contagion happening. So, you know, look at China. China is most probably in a recession. They're, you know, experiencing deflationary uh, pressures. Their, you know, property sector is on the brink of collapse. Um, and, and they're suffering. And you see, so for example, a company like um, Apple, when they released their earnings, the stock was off a lot. Why? Because of weakness in demand for China, for the, in, in China for their, for their goods. And so I think we could continue to see that going forward. Last week was really interesting because we had two economies that surprised us that announced a technical recession. So Japan and uh, the UK. And I think um, over the weekend, we also saw that the, the German central bank is also expecting a recession this year as well. So I kind of wonder, you know, if, if you know, other European countries are going to fall. But these are also larger economies, mm -hmm. you know, Japan, uh, the UK and China, large economies. And so um, I feel as if the US market is, is largely ignoring that risk of contagion. But I think it's there. O overvalued, in other words, the US market? Uh, absolutely, but I mean that's that's more of a concentration risk, you know. And as, as you kind of mentioned earlier with Nvidia, mm -hmm. but it, it's a concentration risk. But absolutely, I think that you know the the risk of a of a recession is probably uh, downplayed in, in the U.S., but I, I think we should be a little bit more cautious. What about the Japanese stock market, which is at multi-decade highs now after being dormant for many, many years? The Nikkei uh, caught fire last year and has continued the rally uh, this year. How do we square that up with uh, Japan being in a, a t at least a technical recession? That's a good question. That's a that's definitely a head scratcher to me, and I think that's just more international money, you know, flocking towards the the Japanese, uh, you know, stock market. But again, I, I've been saying this for a long time. I see such a large disconnect between the economic data and the stock market, both in the U.S. and in Japan. So, you know, I think at one point there, there there's going to have to be some kind of reconciliation to 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 get those aligned. A big part of the North American stock rally, and certainly the U.S. stock rally, has been. A a growing sense of confidence among investors that the U.S. economy is headed for the, the much-desired soft landing. Your thoughts? 
I think the market's already priced in that the soft landing is there. I think the market is priced to perfection, and I think any kind of small deviation to those expectations can cause huge consequences. And we saw that last week when you know CPI numbers in the U.S. were higher than expected, and then all of a sudden the market panicked because everyone was thinking, "Oh my goodness, maybe they're not going to cut rates as as much as uh, or as quickly as as expected." But in, we've always been saying this at New Haven that you're not going to see any rate cuts without there being underlying economic weakness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and we still hold true to that today. So finally, what are you telling clients at New Haven about how they, how their portfolio should be positioned? So we've never invested in any of these high flyer, um, overvalued technology stocks that are, are, you know, like Shopify or NVIDIA that are really mm -hmm. dominating the market. Mm -hmm. So if you take that out of the mix, um, our portfolio is a lot more conservative and have, has less um, fluctuation or volatility. Um, and we just focus on the dividends and the yield. So we we don't care what the market's doing in the short term, as long as you're collecting a 5% dividend, um, you know, our clients are pretty happy with, you know, slow and steady growth. Do you get pushback from your clients on not being in stocks like NVIDIA, Microsoft, Amazon? Um, occasionally, but I think the clients that invest with us, they understand exactly what we're doing and, and you know, pres preservation of capital is the most important thing. And, you know, investing in a stock that, you know, doesn't pay a yield and it's trading at 100 times, you know, earnings uh, is not what our clients are looking for. Well, we're looking at shares of Home Depot off close to 2.5% in the pre-market, another busy week for earnings. And in this case, a company that has had to navigate everything we talk about in the housing market, how higher interest rates has slowed activity, and that can certainly impact things like renovation. Bloomberg Intelligence home building analyst Andrew Reading joining us now. Busy uh, covering these earnings this morning, Andrew. I mean, what were your biggest takeaways from what Home Depot had to say today? Sure. So the four key results were pretty much in line with what we expected. You have to realize that coming into the quarter, the bar was pretty low. And really over the last quarter and a half, the debate has really shifted into how 2024 was going to unfold for the company. So they did provide guidance on same store sales calling for a decline of 1%, which to us was a little light. I think it was a little light um, compared to what some other investors were looking for as well. Um, so we'll look on the call to see how they expect the cadence of that to unfold throughout the year. We do think that the, the first half is going to be particularly challenging with, with maybe conditions improving in the second half. But you, we also think that there's a chance that that 1% that decline may prove conservative. That's, that's not unlike things we've seen from Home Depot in the past. So I noticed in your note this morning, you, you, you gave a quick short-term and long-term analysis. And I guess in the short term, there's macro realities here that are hard for anybody that has a business that is geared toward the housing market is going to you know, have to navigate. You know, when I look at Home Depot shares over the last decade, uh, at least within the Dow, it's a it's a component there. It has easily outperformed that index, but that was also an environment that was a low interest rate environment. So when you think about Home Depot's prospects over the long term versus this short term challenge, how do you think about the company? Sure. So when we look big picture, we think that the home improvement space in general has a number of structural drivers from an industry perspective, um, the first being the potential for, for housing to rebound. We think that existing home sales, which are closely correlated to home improvement spending, may have reached a trough. Um, we actually finished 2024 at the lowest level in more than 25 years. So we think as we move through the balance of this year, if rates start to moderate, we do think that we could see a modest increase in existing home sales. And you know what we know, there are studies out there that show that movers spend about two times as much as owner, homeowners who don't move. So you know there is room for housing to provide a lift going forward. At the same time, we've seen a massive increase in home prices over the last four years um, since the pandemic. Homeowners equity is sitting at record levels now. You know, the, where we sit now with where rates are, it's expensive to tap that equity, but this this is similar to what we expect with existing home sales that as rates start to moderate, we think that provides a, a significant source of pent up demand mm. for bigger bigger ticket projects. OK, and oh, sorry, go ahead, Drew. Well, I was just going to say for Home Depot specifically, I think their biggest opportunity is 
with how they plan to attack the professional contractor market. It's about 50% of sales, but what they, they plan to do is go after larger, more complex projects. So think about large scale renovations that require high volumes of products across many product categories. So they're, they're looking to consolidate the industry where you know, a contractor doesn't have to go to a handful of different suppliers. They could come to Home, Home Depot for everything they need. Most Federal Reserve officials last month issued concerns over moving too quickly to cut interest rates. And this was even before we got that rate of inflation in the United States that came in hotter than expected for perspective. Let's bring in Sarah House, senior economist at Wells Fargo. Uh, Sarah, when you go through some of the meeting minutes, you can clearly see that Fed members are trying to reconcile their view with what the market has been pricing in, you know, as many as six or seven rate cuts so far this year. Right. So I think what we saw is that overall Fed officials remain weary of cutting too early rather than being uh, rather than being too late on it. So they still rather err on the side of bringing inflation back down. So I think that's the most salient point to take away from these minutes. But that's not to say that they haven't seen improvement on the inflation front. So we did see some acknowledgement of that as well, including across different components. But at the end of the day, as we heard from Chair Powell, they just need to see more more of that. Well, and we didn't see that, right, as of our last reading uh, of consumer inflation and producer inflation. How did that affect your thinking when it comes to the trajectory of rate cuts? Right. So heading into the January data, so not just the inflation data, but also the labor market data, we were looking for that first cut to come in May. But I think just given that strength of inflation and that we haven't seen that broad based deceleration that we were seeing in the final months of, of the year, that that along with the strong jobs numbers that we saw, I think it does point towards the Fed likely beginning to start that easing cycle somewhat later. So right now, markets are, are priced for that first cut to come in June, which I think seems pretty reasonable based on the most recent data, as well as how many reports that we'll have between now and then. So we'll get four more reads on the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, as well as four more employment reports. What about other tools that they can use, namely uh, ending quantitative tightening or beginning to taper that off? Do we get greater insight into whether they're thinking about it or whether they're beginning to think about thinking about it? Right. So we did learn at the press conference, Powell said that they were planning to have an in-depth discussion of that in March, and that showed up in the meeting. So we don't have a lot of details on what shape or form that's going to take or the, or the timing, but it does seem that that conversation is moving forward with that in-depth discussion coming in, in March. So I think that the, the, Q, the progress in terms of stopping QT is at least in, in the works. And so we'll, we'll see that. We'll see more about that in the the next meeting, the next press conference. There um, have been issues of not necessarily financial stability, but certainly regional banks that have been uh, in distress. New York Community Bank uh, has been one of them. Obviously, the Fed was able to effectively ring fence the issues with Silicon Valley Bank without derailing their rate hiking campaign. Um, do you get a sense that they feel that they can deal with any instability in the financial markets um, in a similar fashion? So I still think that they're looking at the supervision part of this somewhat separately. And I think they do consider the fact that they have gotten this far with, with rates where they are without seeing broad-based spillover effects that, um, that they're not worried about that financial stability side. And in fact, we did see that portion taken out of the last statement, even though I think there was some mismatch there in the timing with the news of New York Community Bank just coming out that, that morning. But I think overall, this is in some ways to be expected of some of the long tails of that, that tighter policy and not being fully able to, to understand or say with certainty what some of the lags of those higher for, for longer rates are going to be on, on the broader based outlook. Interjects, the renewable energy company, is cutting its distribution, its dividend, by 50%. But the stock went up. We're joined by Michel Letelier, CEO of the company. Michel, it's great to see you. It looks as though, and I saw at least one analyst saying the market was anticipating this, and it seems people, some people are happy it's out of the way. 
Well, I think the market doesn't like uh, incertitude. So I think that uh, the rumor was out there. I mean, analysts have um, discussed about this possibility for a while. So I think that uh, it's better to have uh, the news and explain why we were doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that the message, the key message we were giving is the, the, the thing that we have chosen to cut the dividend, to take advantage of the tremendous growth that we are seeing in our sector. Tell us about, so how much of your, your cash flow will you now be paying out in dividend? Well, well, we're saving roughly 75, uh, 75 million. That represent uh, the payout ratio will be around 35 to 40 percent. So we're keeping uh, roughly 75 to 100 million dollars worth of uh, cash flow to reinvest in a business. And this is very important. It was not a liquidity problem. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, I guess, a new strategy making sure that we would be capturing the uh, greenfield opportunity that we have in our four core market. Well, um, you and I have talked before. The units have been under pressure for a while. Most recently, I think it might have been because of the dividend speculation. What happened in um, your debt is higher than some of your peers. Has that been weighing on uh, perceptions of the company? That's something that we have to explain a little bit. Our we're one uh, of the few uh, companies that have a big portion of hydro asset, mm -hmm. and we have project finance on those uh, assets, which tend to have and, and gather roughly 10 times a bit uh, multiple on, on these uh, long, uh, long life assets. So our, I guess, consolidated debt is skewed a little bit because of that. So we probably have one, one time multiple higher than uh, some of our other peers that have only wind or solar in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. So that we have to explain a little bit more to the investor why we have a little bit more debt. Raymond James saying today that your growth in Canada is resuming. So did you have a kind of a hi hiatus for a while? And how are you growing? Because I think uh, one, uh, there's one project, um, a, a big project in Quebec, I think, is uh, in the harbor for you. Well, yeah, we, we, we've seen Canada. Uh, first of all, Energex has been doing uh, renewable energy since uh, 1990. So we've been at, the, at it for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we've seen some opportunity in Canada in the past, but lately Canada has uh, kind of drained out. But now, boy, it's turning completely. Uh, we used to uh, hear that Hydro-Quebec has had surplus and now they're they're struggling to uh, wow. to double the size of their portfolio. So we have a lot of opportunity. Uh, last time we had the opportunity to bid in British Columbia, it was 14 years ago. Now they're claiming uh, a, a good um, round of RFP uh, opportunity for us. Ontario, same thing, Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. uh, New Brunswick. So there's a lot of activities in Canada for us. Your big money maker then is wind. I think in the the latest quarter, wind was 122 uh, million in EBITDA, hydro was 74, and then solar was pretty small at only about 12 million. Well, solar is a little bit new for us. We have uh, mm -hmm. solar activities in Ontario uh, and uh, in the US, a little bit also in Chile, but of course uh, we have a little bit more uh, wind as you just mentioned. In hydro, we have grown at the beginning with hydro, but hydro is a little bit less competitive than wind in some uh, in some market. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not letting go of the possibility of doing hydro in the future. But the big driver was wind, and it's probably going to be still wind uh, with some solar. But battery storage is picking up quite a bit as well. And it's interesting. I, apparently, one roadblock you've had, I'm sure it's not unique to you with your projects in America, actually getting connected into the grid has encountered delays. Can you tell us about that? Well, that's a big issue, right? Uh, I mean, everybody now wants to have access to renewable energy, but the utility got a little bit, uh, got surprised to some degree with the demand of uh, uh, interconnection, and it'll be It'll be a challenge. I guess that uh, Canada's not so bad. There are some places where we can interconnect, but the U.S. is really, really challenging in terms of interconnection. I think that uh, this is unfortunately the bottleneck uh, to have more and more renewable energy, affordable uh, 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 renewable energy in many markets, is the ability to interconnect.
All right, trading day is just getting underway and that Nvidia halo effect continues. Let's take a look at the broad market action. We don't see it unfortunately on the TSX because we don't have that same kind of AI pizzazz, at least on an index basis, but you're seeing it in a major way on the S&P 500, be a fresh record high if we close here. And for the NASDAQ, if we close at these levels, the NASDAQ 100 is already at all time highs, but the NASDAQ composite would be at a fresh record high if we close at these levels, the, taking out the last previous high of 16,057 that we last saw in November 2021. Let's bring in Liz Ann Saunders, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. I mean, Liz Ann, we can't get away from conversations about NVIDIA, even if you want to look <laughs> at the other 490 stocks, right? Yeah, and, and even uh, uh, with me, I'm not a stock analyst. I don't cover any individual stocks. Um, I'm 30,000 foot macro. I can't get away from <laughs> talking about it, but it but it's in the context of, of the broader market. And it's, you know, it's it's the magnificent one, so to speak. <laughs> It absolutely is, and I'd love to take that, take it from that perspective because you're right. You have to look at macro calls. You have to look at asset allocation. You have to look at diversification. It's so hard, though, as this behemoth starts to bleed into all of those categories. It, it is, and but what you are seeing is there. There's much more dispersion even within the, the group, the so-called Magnificent Seven. In fact, that, that moniker came about because, at least last year, the, the stocks represented by that were the seven largest stocks. But Tesla's now dropped out of the top seven. It's been bouncing between number nine and number 10. Berkshire Hathaway and Eli Lilly leapfrogged both of them, which is why some are saying, okay, maybe it's the sensational six. But even among that seven, we know Tesla's been an underperformer, ranked at the near the bottom of the pack year to date. NVIDIA, of course, ranked at the top of the pack, but even Apple is ranked around, you know, 300 something. Um, so much more dispersion. And then even on a day like today, where you're still in sort of the honeymoon after NVIDIA's earnings, you see small caps really catching a bid. And I do, do think it shows that there are investors, there is money out there looking for opportunities outside of just that very small handful of names down the cap spectrum. We think you still need to stay up in quality, but I think that you, you're starting to see some early signs that maybe there is some interest in names other than just the obvious. The Russell is interesting, and I'm glad that you brought that up because it's been, you know, there's been a number of head fakes, right? You know, is it the time? Oh, yeah. Are we going to get um, some outperformance? And we've been kind of, it's been very choppy so far in uh, 2024. When you look at underlying reasons to be bullish for small caps uh, or the Russell index, what do you see? Well, first of all, uh, an index like the Russell, which has 1,800 and change mm -hmm. uh, stocks in it, you can't you can't analyze it monolithically. Small caps is not some singular thing, and I think specific to the Russell 2000, a lot of people don't realize that 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 Russell doesn't use a profitability filter, which is why you still have somewhere in the 30 some odd percent of companies that are some combination of zombie companies, which means they don't have enough cash flow to pay interest on their debt or not profitable. You know, an index like the S&P 600, which is not used as much as a benchmark, maybe because it's harder to beat, mm -hmm. has a profitability filter. So I think, yeah, there are opportunities in small caps, but you can't look at it with a monolithic lens because you've got a lot of really low quality, not profitable zombie companies in there. And I think that's the segment within small caps that you definitively want to avoid. When you look at factors for outperformance, it's been all about momentum and left in the dust yet again is dividend yield. This is even as you know, if you're if you're a long term investor, you have the opportunity to lock in dividend yield on on stocks that can also possibly giving give you, you know, outright appreciation. But that's the possible part. There's a risk yeah. associated with the price component of a stock that even might pay a decent dividend. And when in the true safety of cash or money markets, you're, you're generating a yield higher than a dividend yield without that underlying price risk, assuming you're holding it to maturity on the fixed income side. 
I, I think that's part of the reason why dividend yield, which in general might be seen as a within the sort of quality basket of factors, is different in an environment where you've come off the zero bound and you now have reasonable uh, yields. So I think that's why the quality factors this time and momentum, by the way, people think of momentum when when it's when the word is used as sort of the high flying tech kind of stocks. Momentum is a factor. It's a characteristic. Mm -hmm. It means the stocks that have been working continue to work. You can have times where momentum is in energy stocks or momentum is in utility stocks. It happens to be in those higher growth type stocks in this environment. But the real places we've been emphasizing at the factor level are things like interest coverage, especially when yields are, are moving up, the, the strong cash flow, strength of balance sheet, but also growth type factors like um, visibility in terms of earnings, positive earnings surprise, uh, positive earnings revisions. And, and that's, uh, it's a quality wrapper, but they're not always the same factors inside a quality wrapper. Well, I'm glad that you hinted at the ability to cover interest rates because uh, interest expense, because uh, this backdrop of the rally has happened at a time where those uh, rates, the U.S. 10-year yield, has been moving higher at around 4.3 percent. At what point do you think it it presents a headwind to stocks? Um, you know, because normally it does. So I think, you know, we saw last year the, the big spike up in the 10-year yield from sub 4% to 5% that occurred from the middle part of July to the latter part of October. That was directly correlated to the only correction, full-blown correction we had last year, 10% or so in the S&P and 12% in the NASDAQ. And then, of course, yields plunged from 5 back down to under 4, and that allowed for the rally that began in late October. But in, in, and interestingly, the initial couple months of that rally was very very much in favor of small caps of equal weight relative to cap weight. Uh, but then things settled down. And I now think there's just a lot more fine tooth combing happening in terms of, OK, yields have picked back up again. They've gone from call it, you know, three, eight and change to four, three. Um, I think there's more fine tooth combing of where are the hits going to be, the, the zombie companies, what's their debt maturity schedule. And, and the same thing is happening, by the way, in financials with, with you know, near community bank mm -hmm. and exposure to commercial real estate. We're not monolithic just sort of throwing everything out or lumping everybody in. I think this is an environment where you've got to look company by company and, and really take a, a more detailed uh, approach to figuring out where the landmines are.